Good. All right. So last class, we talked about uh, what was the model that we talked about? Linear periodization, right? What was in its essence linear periodization? Like what were we talking about there? Like what was the little graph and everything that I used to describe exactly what linear periodization was? Who remembers? I believe uh, over time the intensity goes up and the number of reps goes down. Exactly. Over time our intensity goes up and the reps go down, all right? So we had that little graph where we had the intensity and then the reps. Or I'm sorry, the other way around. Reps and intensity. And they started to move and they intersected. And what we were working towards was a test or a peak. So we wanted to make sure that everything that we were doing was building towards that point, okay? Um, going back a little bit further, we talked about the three main portions of writing a program. What was the largest portion that we had that we compared to a full year of training uh, at Jones? Who remembers? No, no, no. What was it called? What was it called? Called the macro cycle. Macro cycle. Absolutely. It was called a macro cycle. All right. So we had a macro cycle, which we equated to a full year of training at Jones. All right. What was the section underneath that where we talked about from test to test? Mesocycle. Mesocycle. Absolutely. And then the smallest portion of it where we were just talking about one week of training, which for us equated to three days of training. What was that? We had macro, meso, and what was the third? Micro cycle, absolutely. We had a micro cycle, okay? Then going back even further, what did that fall under in terms of, we were talking about Milo and the Bull and the, the, the story and the theory that came up in terms of training from Milo and the Bull. We also called it adaptation, or adaptation was a part of it. But what was the, uh, the, the term that we used there, or the phrase? Progressive overload. So progressive overload is just simply just creating a stimulus for the body that is harder than the previous stimulus so we continue to get better at whatever it is that we're trying to do. In Milo's case, he was trying to get stronger. So as the bull grew in size, so did his strength grow because he had to keep picking it up and carrying it around every day. Okay? Today, we are talking about the conjugate method. Okay? When I am working with athletes, there are two main methods that I use. I use the, um, the linear periodization model that we talked about. That is the most basic one. When I have athletes that are just very inexperienced in the weight room or have very limited training time under me and I wanna get a good feel and build a good solid base of strength, that's where I push them to. Then from there, more of my advanced athletes use more of a conjugate approach, okay? Conjugate method in and of itself, um, a lot of people don't understand this, but it actually started out as a weightlifting program, okay? Remember we talked about weightlifting as a sport being the only Olympic barbell sport. What are the two components? Well, there's three technically, but let me give me two of the components of Olympic style weightlifting. What are the two main competition lifts that we're focusing on with Olympic style weightlifting? Clean and jerk was one of them. I heard somebody say clean and jerk. What was the first portion? Started with an S. Squat. Nope, that's power lifting. So, Sumo, squat. No, no, no. That, that, you're, you're thinking power lifting. It was SN started with. We had blank and clean and jerk. Snatch. Snatch. There you go. Great. So we have the snatch. The clean and jerk, and then we had the press. Remember we talked about that at the very beginning of weightlifting, they had the press that was part of it as well. So these were the three, three main movements that we were training in terms of Olympic style weightlifting. And the conjugate method was used by a club called the Dynamo Club. So the Dynamo Club was based in Russia. It was a private training group that had their own method and they were dominating the sport of weightlifting. And the main thing behind their training 
what they found was they trained a wide variety of movements. They had a wide variety of movements that focused on the building strength in the snatch, the clean and jerk, and the press. So they weren't just doing snatches and clean and jerks. They were doing hangs, they were doing partials, they were doing pulls, pauses, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And what they found out was that if you got stronger in a movement that you were not particularly strong at, that carried over to getting you better at the snatch and the clean and jerk, all right? And then eventually, so they dominated the sport. Timeline-wise, somebody's gonna kill me because I'm probably gonna be wrong, but I would imagine this was around the 40s to maybe even the 60s where they were dominating in terms of just cranking out athlete after athlete. And then when they got rid of the press, they were still applying it to just the snatch and the clean and jerk. Then what happened is you had other countries who you had athletes who didn't like all the variety of movements. They wanted to pare things down a little bit. They wanted to make things a little bit simpler. And then you had the Bulgarian method and all these other methods. But the conjugate method itself started out as a weightlifting methodology utilized by the Dynamo Club. All right? So if you see anybody ever talking about Dynamis, Dynamo, blah, 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 it's a nod to the origins of the conjugate method and that Russian club that uh, dominated the sport for so long. Now, how we mostly know about the conjugate method is from a powerlifting standpoint. So we've talked about powerlifting more recently than we talked about weightlifting. What are the three lifts that we focus on with powerlifting? Come on now. Speak up, speak up. Deadlift. Deadlift, okay. Okay, what's the third? Squat. Yep, deadlift, bench, and squat. Jeez, my writing is terrible, okay? So those are the three. What happened here was, for the most part, people who were competing in the sport of powerlifting were competing in a more linear periodization or western periodized model where the intensity would start to go up, the reps would start to go down as they were peaking for their meat. There was a gentleman by the name of Louis Simmons. All right? Louis Simmons broke his back, not once, but twice. And so while he was recovering from his back injury, he started thinking of different ways of training, thinking that there had to be a better way. There had to be something else that we were missing in terms of how to train better for powerlifting. So he found old text that he got translated about the Dynamo Club, a gentleman named Bud Charnaga. Uh, uh, who, who's, who's still very popular in weightlifting. He's put out a lot of great books um, on training methodologies and stuff like that. But Louis Simmons got a hold of some of his books from the Dynamo Club, had them translated, and he started reading about them working speed and them working max effort and them using all sorts of variety in their training. And he created what is known as the West Side Method. All right? Some of you may have heard of this. Some of you may have not, and that's okay. But the West Side Method is a stem from conjugate, okay? Conjugate is this overarching theme. West Side is Louis, inter Louis Simmons' interpretation of the conjugate method, which is what most of us know as the conjugate method. All right, so we're going to focus more on it in the sense of what Louis' interpretation is, because nowadays we have coaches that have taken this information and have spread it and have, have, have made their own little uh, niches in their fields using what Louis has researched and found out over years of experience and trial and error and stuff along that. But the bread and butter of it is Louis Simmons has the West Side Method, which utilizes max effort work, dynamic effort work, and repetition effort work, okay? The big thing to know about the conjugate method is that there's no deload, essentially, and that's the one thing that always threw me off with the conjugate method, is the way everything works is there is no deload week. You can go up and down intensity and stuff like that, and you can, you can manage the volume as you get closer to a competition or whatever your test date is, but there is no official back off week in the conjugate method, um, or at least in the way that Louis Simmons has interpreted it. And the thing about the method, and the reason a lot of people like it, especially in like the, the strength and conditioning world for sports teams and stuff like that, is you're just constantly operating at a high level because of the max effort work and the dynamic effort work and the repetition effort work, okay? 
So we're gonna go through and we're gonna break down each one of these sections and then you, I'm gonna help you guys, you're gonna help me, we're gonna work together and we're gonna write out a four week training program based off of these methodologies and how I interpret Louis Simmons's uh, interpretation of the conjugate method, all right? Does anybody have any questions on this before I erase it? Uh, is, is Louis Simmons that, like, that dude from Ohio? Yeah, yeah, he's, ba yeah, he's based out of Columbus, Ohio. Uh, a private facility, uh, not anybody can just train there. You have to be invited to train there. Um, it's kind of considered one of like the meccas of powerlifting. Like when the Arnold is out there every year, almost everybody I know takes a ride out to West Side to go hang out with Louie. Um, it's a place that I have yet to visit and I really want to, but I don't want to go there when there's a ton of people there. I want to sit there and visit and talk to him about how he trains athletes, how he works with kids, all that kind of stuff. And I just kind of want to just sit there and pick the guy's brain and stuff like that because he is a fountain of information. I, I, I listen to his podcast. I've got a couple of his books, and I subscribe to one of his uh, uh, Q&A things that he uh, uh, posts on the internet. He's a really smart guy. He can kind of be a little kooky at times, go off on tangents, and just kind of just say things that don't really make sense. But at its core, the man is a genius and has done more for strength sports than most other coaches have. He's, he's world-renowned, world-respected, so if you ever get a chance to read something that he's written, like I definitely would recommend it. Just don't always listen to his podcast because he likes to repeat the same stuff over and over. All right, any questions before I erase this? What does DE stand for again? DE, dynamic effort. We're gonna go over all that, I promise. Each one of these is gonna be its own little section. So we have max effort, dynamic effort, repetition effort. Good? Good. So, max effort work. Or for shorthand, you're going to see it written as ME in a lot of text and articles and stuff like that. Does anybody want to take a guess at what max effort uh, 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 we're working on here? I'm guessing from the title itself, you're putting, up much, you're putting on as much weight as you can while doing like very low repetition. Yeah, you'd be 100% right. So the premise of maximum effort is we are pushing for a new one rep max in a variety of movements. So the big thing that Louie was known for in particular and that what he took from the Dynamo Club was the number of max effort lifts that he would come up with. I believe for the squat in and of itself between different partial range of motions and bars and all sorts of different stuff, like he's come up with like over a hundred different variations of just the squat alone, okay? So the thing to know about the variety is you have your traditional lifts Louis doesn't believe in doing the traditional lifts too often, but for simplicity's sake, I'm, I'm also giving you how I interpret it. We do a lot of the, simp the, the, the basic movements because we're not all competing in powerlifting or anything along those lines. So you have the traditional lifts. You have partial range of motion. So for us at Jones, we've done this in the essence of floor presses. We've done a lot of floor presses at Jones. We've done box squats. We haven't done a ton of block pulls, which is essentially you put a plate under the bars and then you lift the bar from a higher position. Those are also called rack pulls. Those are the three main big partial range of motion movements, but you can add all sorts of other varieties in there. Another thing that he adds in here is accommodating resistance. I'm gonna butcher spelling this, so don't judge me because I'm not an English teacher. All right. Accommodating resistance is he either adds bands or chains to the lift to make it harder in a different type of way. All right. And then the last one that I'm going to add on here is isometrics. 
Um, this is not necessarily something that uh, Louis pushes. I've seen him do these, but what I've seen these done more is with strength and conditioning coaches getting athletes ready for competitions. This is great for max effort work in a competition. Does anybody have any idea what an isometric is? Uh, sort of. Let's keep going with that, that, that thought process. It isolates how, where you're working with that muscle group. Like a, like a bicep curl? Uh, that's an isolated movement, not necessarily an isometric. So, like, what's the difference between an isolated movement and, like, isometric? So, so an isometric is essentially you are standing still, but pull, uh, still applying force. Okay. So think about it this way at Jones. You know how they have those long arms that we have that can come out of the racks? Yeah. If you were to take a barbell and go underneath the rack and pull up into the rack, you're not going to go very far, right? Because those, those aren't going to move, right? Right. But your body is still working just as hard as if you were doing a full range of motion deadlift. So an isometric movement is where you are placing the body under stress, but you're not moving through the range of motion. You are staying in one spot or you are isolated in one spot, but the body is still putting forth maximum effort to try to pretend like it's going to move that weight at some point. But there is absolutely no chance of that happening. So that's an isometric. So I've seen these used a lot with athletes in season, and I really like it. Um, it. It doesn't tax the central nervous system as much, doesn't tear as much muscle fibers, you're not gonna be as sore, but you're still putting forth huge amounts of effort to complete these movements. These are usually timed or anything like that, so which is why I threw those in here, okay? Now, what I wanna do now is I wanna create an exercise library for you guys, okay? So we're gonna go lower body, and upper body of some max effort movements that we can do. Keep in mind what we talked about. We have traditional lifts, partial range of motion, accommodating resistance. Don't really necessarily have to worry about that one. Isometrics, sort of, okay? I wanna create about five or six lifts for each of these that we can use for our program that we're gonna design at the end of this lecture. So, lower body wise, give me some exercises that you think would be a good fit for the max effort portion of this program. Um, squats, uh, lunges? Uh, not necessarily lunges. Let's put in back squat and front squat. Okay. Some people would use a lunge. I personally don't think so. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a low risk, high reward type guy. So something like a lunge, if you have an inexperienced lifter trying to max out their lunge, they're probably going to hurt themselves in some form or fashion, and I just don't want people getting hurt. So I won't use a lunge or like a single leg lift as a max effort movement, more accessory work, if that makes sense, or even repetition effort. Does that make sense? What else we got here? We got front squat, we got back squat. What else are we going to add? Come on now. We can use pulling motions and pushing motions here. Dead. Yep, so we got deadlift. We're going to put both deadlifts in here. You have conventional, which is where your feet are close together, and then sumo, which is the one that I use all the time. Sumo is where your feet are wide. What are some other motions? Think about partial range of motions. I literally gave you two, two examples when we were talking about the partial range of motion stuff that we can add to here, what were two of those lifts? Box squat. Box squat, perfect. Okay, what else? What did I call the thing that where you said, uh, you raised the, the height of the bar before you pulled? No, that's for, we'll use that for upper body. This is for lower still. Started with an R. What? A rack lift? Rack pull, rack pull. Okay. One more I'd like to add on here. I'd at least like to have discussion to see if you guys agree or not. What about a box jump? For max height or a broad jump, do you think that would be a good lower body max effort movement if you don't have access to equipment? 
Or like a vertical jump, testing your vertical. Yeah. Okay, so let's put a jump. All right, upper body, what do we got? We have, somebody said floor press. Let's add floor press over here right away. What else we got? Bench press. Bench press, obvious one there. What else? Think about our last unit where we talked about our program structure. We, I gave you a couple different overhead movements that we used. Overhead press. Overhead press, what else? Similar to an overhead press, but you were allowed to use your legs. Starts with a P, ends with an ush. Oh, now. It's not push ups, is it? Uh, you got the first word right. What is this? What does this stand for? Add that to the first word. Come on now. Push overhead press. Push press. Push press. You don't need to throw the overhead in there. Push press. That's another one. All right. What else we got? Talking about body weight. We got body weight over here with jump variations. What about like a pull up? Could you could what do you what would you consider a pull up like a, a weighted pull up as a max effort movement? Yeah. Okay. Your body mass that's from below your arm. Exactly. Exactly. So for some people, that may just be their body weight. Okay. So I like this. This is a good start on some upper body movements that we can test. Remember, our goal is to try to build the bench, the squat, and the deadlift. Okay. Does anybody have any questions on this before I erase it? Um, what does it say under front squat? Uh, so conventional front squat. dead. So C-O-N-V-E-N-T-I-O-N-A-L. Conventional dead. And that, that's just the narrow stance style of deadlift. Yes? I was going to say, what about the, the last two under box squats? Rack pull and jump variation. Yep. Got it? All right, we're going to race this. Move on to dynamic effort. So, if max effort work, uh, screw something up. 